What if we were to view this year the same way we would view the span of our entire life? Now, I know some of you might be thinking, why would I want to do that? This year's been a dumpster fire. But track with me for a second. Uh, the reality is this year has had some sweet memories. It's had some regrets. It's had lessons learned, highs and lows. Uh, even as far as Cornerstone goes, perhaps you remember at the beginning of the year, we actually had a worship conference that we put on. I know it feels like it was like a lifetime ago, but it was this really great thing. We had people all in the same room. Uh, you know, we, we put in all of this work and effort and, and it was a blast. We had a ton of fun. Uh, I remember the night before I was like up the whole night, couldn't go to sleep because I was just so excited. It's like, oh man, this is what we've been preparing for. This is what we put all this effort into. And it was so cool the day of, especially seeing our Cornerstone people all coming together and uh, working hard and, and then meeting new people that came in. And it just, it was just this really cool thing. It's this really sweet memory for me. And then COVID hit and you know, we, we know how that went this year, but you know, as, as we look at life as a whole, the reality is there are highs and lows. There are ups and downs. Um, some parts of our life seem amazing and yet a lot of it seems hard. Uh, there's a reason you hear people talking about the good old days, right? It's like, well, somehow we never realize we're in the good old days uh, while we're in the good old days. But it's very easy for life to go on and after a while you just look at hardship and you think, oh yeah, I remember once upon a time I had some sweet memories. Highs and lows, that's life. I think uh, if we were to take a personal inventory of this year of our, of our life in general, um, through the lens of Philippians 3, uh, I think there's some insights that we can pick up, some, some lessons. So let me read this to you real quick. Philippians 3, 7 through 15, Paul says, But everything that was a gain to me I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him I have suffered the loss of all things, and consider them as dung, so that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that, that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. My goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. Not that I have already reached the goal or am already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way and if you think differently about anything God will reveal this also to you so here's my starting insight for this is that losing doesn't make me a loser for most of this year um, yeah it was not so great there were a lot of losses I think for a lot of people they would say that they ended the year worse than it started Maybe you had a loss this year, whether it was a job, income, um, maybe a friend, a loved one. Maybe it was your health. But the end result of loss is not always bad. It's not. It definitely feels that way at the time. And even after a while, it may still feel that way. But the end result of loss is not always a bad thing. Failure doesn't define you. It often resets our focus. It, it rearranges our priorities. Suddenly it's live for God, love people, like things. Where most of our life is love things, live for things. 
exploit people, get what I want. And a loss really refocuses. What, what is it that is really important in life? What is it that God really desires of my life? And because, and this is huge, because God is at work in your life, sufferings are repurposed for his good work. Uh, the present losses and sufferings are, are being used by God for your eternal benefit. Um, 1 Peter 1, 6-7, Paul puts it this way, uh, excuse me, Peter puts it this way, you rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable, is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. I don't know if any of you saw this documentary on Netflix. I highly recommend it. Uh, it's called The Speed Cubers. I watched it on a whim, just like, ah, it looks kind of interesting. Basically, it's a documentary about uh, com or competitive Rubik's cubing. Okay, you know Rubik's cubes, you, you twist them and you try and get all the same color on each side of the cube. Uh, apparently they have competitions about this and they're crazy. So uh, a lot of them are really young people, but they, they solve these Rubik's Cubes in matters of seconds. In fact, uh, one of the main characters in the documentary is a, is a young man named Max. And he's the world record holder for solving Rubik's Cube in less than seven seconds, which I've never solved it to begin with, let alone under 10 seconds. It's mind blowing. Uh, the other interesting thing about Max is that he's autistic and so a lot of the show turned out really not to be so much about people trying to win competitions as much as it was about friendship and uh, relationships and Max's parents and, and trying to help him develop the life skills he needs. And so one of the other main characters in this film was um, another young man named Felix and Felix was the former world champ and was sort of this idolized hero by Max like Max looked at him as this, like the greatest in the world even though Max eventually got better than him but one of the like heartfelt moments in this whole documentary was toward the end when Max lost and spoiler here right Max lost the world championship and, and his parents were, were concerned with how he was going to deal with this. Um, and so looking at it from the competitor perspective, it's can I win? Can I be the best? Can I avoid the loss? For the parents of Max, there's a whole different perspective. It's, it's how can all of this competition be an opportunity for their son to develop the social skills he needs to live a healthy uh, life. And so th there's this moment at the end where he loses the championship and you know he's heartbroken, but there's, there's this scene where Felix, his hero, is sort of consoling him and uh, Max basically says, um, no podium makes a stronger, right? And Felix goes, exactly. And it's this really cool thing where, you know, Max realizes, oh, wait a minute, I didn't win, I didn't get on the podium, but that makes me stronger, right, Felix? And, and his hero says, yeah, exactly. And then right after that, you see Max realizing, wait, Felix didn't get on the podium either. And you see this, this heartache in him for his friend, his hero, and realizing he didn't get what he was hoping to achieve either. And, and how, do you, how do you convey those emotions? And so it does some interviews with the parents uh, talking about this. And um, the father uh, says that the biggest fear that I've always had was how Max was going to deal with loss. You know, how, how do you deal with the rejection of a loss? 
And so from the parent's perspective, it's how can we use this hurt, this suffering, to better his life in, in the overall scheme of things? Um, from, a, from a life perspective, the father saw this loss is actually a really good thing for my son. Uh, he's able to empathize with another human. He's able to deal with his own emotions. And, and so he says the big win for us is that he did okay emotionally. This loss enabled him to gain something that was so much more valuable than a trophy. And so Paul, in this verse in Philippians, he, he basically says that, hey, even the things that I won in life, my gains, they were nothing. Because ultimately enabled him to gain Christ, right? So verse seven, but everything that was a gain to me, I have considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Because of him, I have suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dumb so that I may gain Christ. Even the gains he would consider as a loss compared to the most important thing, which was Christ. To know the creator of the world, to to know the one who gave his very life for you, the sustainer of all things, the one that we will spend eternity in heaven with. Paul goes, that is so much more important than everything. Even the things I would consider a gain, it's a loss. Second insight from this verse, uh, as we kind of look back at the year, as we look at our life, is that humility is better than hard work. Not that hard work's bad, but humility's better. In verse nine, as he's saying that, you know, all this is considered a loss so that he could gain Christ. He says, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own from the law, but one that is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I don't know about you, but self-righteousness comes really easy to me. It's really easy to look at others and go, well, at least I'm not that bad, or oh, at least I don't have that problem, or wow, I'm glad I avoided that in my life. And then it's also easy to look and say, oh, I'll never be as good as that. Oh, I'm never that talented. Oh, I wish I could be like that. Oh, and, and then have a little pity party. It's always comparing ourselves to others. It's always me, me, me. We have to be really careful with that. Uh, the reality is the only ruler that we have to measure ourselves up against is Jesus. And the great thing is he already did everything for us that we couldn't do for ourselves. So we have to trust more and cling to grace as opposed to thinking, I need to do this. I need to do something for myself. And so, so Paul recognizes that that real intimacy with Christ doesn't come through self-effort. It comes through faith based on the good grace of, of Christ. Third insight is that I still need the gospel. I still need the gospel. Uh, the gospel is, is not just for the sinner who has not yet repented. Um, verse 10 through 11, my goal is to know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death, assuming that I will somehow reach the resurrection from among the dead. He, Paul lays it out real simple that, that the power of the resurrection, which we all very much need, we have to be well acquainted with the cross and the tomb. If I want that power in my life, I, I need to be acquainted with the cross and the tomb. The crucifixion, the resurrection, these are things that Jesus was just really blunt with his disciples about. Now, a lot of times they didn't get it. They're like, what do you mean you're going to die? What? But he was very clear. Like, this is part of the package. He didn't hide this when he called his disciples. 
Uh, he didn't minimize the cost of what it meant to follow him. So verse 23 of Luke 9 says, Then he said to them, this is Jesus, Then he said to them all, If anyone wants to follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will save it. So each day is about dying to ourselves. It's about... Uh, identifying with the sufferings of Christ. Like I, I'm, I'm dying to my own desires, my own wants, and I am living for my Father in heaven. The final insight here is to never give up hope. Never give up hope. Philippians 3, 12 through 15, not that I have already reached the goal or I'm already perfect, but I make every effort to take hold of it because I also have been taken hold of by Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let all of us who are mature think this way. And if you think differently about anything, God will reveal this also to you. None of us have arrived, right? We, we all push forward. We're not yet complete. We're, we haven't finished maturing. Um, you can't lose sight of the prize. Can't lose sight of the prize. So we have to be patient. We have to be persistent. Uh, it's ultimately saying, I'm forgetting what's behind and I'm pushing forward to what's ahead. How many of us spend our lives just dwelling on the past? Oh, if only I'd done that. Oh, if only this person hadn't done this to me. Whatever it is, when we just focus and dwell on all the things in the past that you can't do anything about anyway, instead of focusing on what's ahead. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to drive a car while you're paying attention to the car behind you. It doesn't work real well. <laughs> you have to have your eyes forward, looking at where you're going, if you want to get there successfully. And so we have hope, ultimately, this is, this is huge. We have hope because God is actually working at all of this harder than we are, right? In Philippians 1.6, it says, I am sure of this, that he who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. That is a great perspective to take into this new year. That it's God that is at work in you. And so I am going to humbly trust him that whatever happened this past year, it's in the, and it's in the past now. I'm focusing on this new year. I'm focusing on the rest of my life how can I live for God? How can I trust him that he is at work and he is going to take even my losses and my sufferings and use them for my good and my eternal good? Would you pray for me? Father God, thank you. Thank you that you take even our losses and turn them into wins. Thank you that you uh, give us opportunities to grow and to mature. And, and Lord, I pray that this year, as we look back on it, uh, we would take insights into how to apply uh, these things to the rest of our life. Lord, um, I pray that in the midst of the, the hurts and the losses, that we recognize how deeply we needed you. And so, Father God, I pray that uh, more than anything, we would uh, walk away from this year recognizing that we need you, that we need to trust you and be humble and to allow you to work in our life um, throughout this coming year and from here going forward. So Lord, thank you for all these things. Thank you that you're the one at work. And we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. Take care, everybody.